Thank you, James. Uh, can everybody hear okay? Well, yeah, I'm really surprised uh, there's so much interest in uh, falling in love. Uh, we uh, were just uh, musing that if we'd had this talk in Paris, you know, nobody would have come you know, to such a talk. Um, it's such a passe topic. So uh, anyway, welcome everybody. I really want to thank uh, CIS and the Graduate uh, Site Department for organizing this. And, uh, and of course, James, who you just heard uh, from, and uh, Connor over here in the corner have done all the work to making this event happen tonight. Uh, in case you don't know, there are martinis over there uh, hidden in the, in the corner uh, and wine. So make yourselves at home and uh, hope you enjoy tonight. Um, so I'm going to talk for about um, maybe 40 minutes. Uh, or so, and then we're going to go into a little discussion. Uh, and our discussant, uh, Frank Eckenhofer, is going to help with that. And Frank is going to kind of be moving around the room tonight. Um, uh, is that loud enough? Is that not loud enough? A little louder? Yeah? How's that? Yeah? All right, well, just shout up. So, what does it mean to fall in love? That's really the topic of tonight's uh, event. Can anybody fall in love? Or are just some people capable and others are not capable? What exactly has to happen in order to fall in love? And what is this uh, phenomenon that distinguishes the idea of falling from other kinds of loving? even other kinds of loving that are also erotic uh, in nature. So the first thing we need to, uh, I think, take in is that the word love itself is imprecise uh, in the English language. It can mean a lot of different things uh, in different kinds of relationships. In fact, it may not even connote a feeling at all. Um, for example, is the love that a mother feels for her child the same that a young man feels the first time he's ridden on a motorcycle? Is the love of God the same as the love for a sexual partner or the love of food? Is the love for oneself the same as the love for fishing or driving fast or the cinema? And what about the drug experience? Don't drugs elicit feelings that we sometimes associate with intense and unremitting pleasure or equanimity? Do we take drugs to approximate the feeling of love that is missing in our lives? Clearly all these experiences are not the same. And the feelings that we associate with them even if we say we love every one of them is distinct. What we call falling in love is first and foremost an eroticized sexual experience compounded by an intense emotional connection with a person to whom I feel attracted. There are other non-sexualized ways of loving but none of those occasion falling in love. This kind of love is always sexual. Enjoying fantastic sex with someone, however, in and of itself, isn't enough to fall in love with that person. Great sex may be pleasurable, but not necessarily accompanied by a feeling of deep love. The minimum requirement for being in love and falling in love is the integration of physical sexual attraction and experiencing a profound and loving connection to another person. So what are the signs that you are falling in love? Say you meet a person you're attracted to. You spend an evening together. 
you feel this amazing connection to this person. One thing leads to another, and you spend the night together making love. You feel this is the most wonderful sexual experience that you've ever had, and you don't want the night to end. The first sign that you're falling in love is that you can't bear being separated from this person. This turns out to be the essential prerequisite for knowing that you're in love. In a word, love seeks proximity and demands it. You want to be with this person all the time. You can't bear being separated. And when you are, you think about this person constantly. That is the first sign that you're falling in love. The second sign that you're falling in love is that you become obsessed with this person. <laughs> uh, rings the <of> bell, huh? <laughs> you can't get them out of your mind. This is a mental way of achieving proximity when you're separated. Proximity and obsession feed each other. The third sign that you're falling in love is an extraordinary feeling of happiness. If you've never felt happy before, you feel it now. Your life is completely different and everything has changed. Whatever problems you were struggling with, whether financial, your living situation, a terrible job, a graduate school you feel trapped in, <laughs> doesn't matter. You're happy, damn it. All because this person has come into your life and you want to be with him or her constantly. You not only want to be close to this person, to touch them, kiss them, caress, hold them, you want to be with them forever. This is the fourth sign. You want love to last. This is how Plato defined love and so on, which is what people who cannot fall in love do. After all, variety is the spice of life, isn't it? Well, when you're in love, variety is not the spice of life. Variety is out, permanence is in. Isn't this why we invented marriage? To hang on to this person for dear life? Maybe you felt this way for someone and maybe you haven't. But let's say that you have. What if this person you are so in love with isn't in love with you? What if that person falls out of love with you and ends the relationship while you're still in love with them? How do you feel about that? Compassionate? Indifferent? Amused? I don't think so. <laughs> you feel like you just fell off a cliff. You want to die. This is when you're thinking, Thank God for drugs. <laughs> but drugs don't really help all that much. After all, we're talking about the experience of unrequited love. The experience that Sigmund Freud said is the most painful feeling there is. In other words, rejection sucks. And none of us take it so well. Now your life has no meaning, and you can't understand how such a thing could have happened. And even when you saw it coming, as we often do, and you thought you were obsessed with this person when you were in love with them, now you really know what it's like to be obsessed with somebody, night and day, every day, without respite. And how long are we capable of being obsessed? the person who has rejected us. Some people never get over it. They've been stuck in it all their lives and they can't find a way out. And then there's the question of judgment. Everyone knows 
That goes out the window the moment you fall in love. Ordinarily, we exercise at least a modicum of judgment when weighing the virtues of another person. What kind of person, for example, would you enter into a business relationship with? Or loan money to? Or embrace as a confidant or a mentor that you trust with your life? Falling in love? All such sentiments go out the window as you impulsively put yourself at the mercy of a person who, for all you know, would just as soon cut off your head and eat you for breakfast. Judgment and love are incompatible. Yet we would put our lives on the line for such a person. Yes, you probably have to be mad to fall in love. But what kind of madness are we talking about? Is it the kind of madness we should avoid or a madness we should pursue because it is the epitome of everything good in life? Now these are only some of the questions I want to explore this evening. I'll begin with a quote from Janet Malcolm, uh, the psychoanalytic author and critic, quoting Malcolm, According to Freud, our personal relationships are a messy tangle of misapprehensions. At best, an uneasy truce between powerful, solitary fantasy systems. Even romantic love is fundamentally solitary and has at its core a profound impersonality. The concept of transference destroys faith in personal relations and explains why they are tragic. We cannot know each other. End of quote. So if Malcolm is correct in this dark assessment of our tragically human condition, why is Freud's thesis that love is always an illusion so difficult to accept? What is Freud getting at when he claims that the person I think I fell in love with isn't, in fact, the person I thought they were. Who, then, is this person? In order to answer this question, we first need to take just a brief detour through the earliest stages of our childhoods, where we were first shaped, beginning with our first taste of love. One of Freud's most original contributions to our understanding about love is contained in a statement from his early book, Three Essays on Sexuality. Quote, the finding of an object of love is in fact a refinding of it. Now this statement is perhaps Freud's most profound contribution to our understanding of love, and just about everyone is familiar with it. <laughs> the child's first experience of love is at the mother's breast which is the most blissful experience anybody can imagine. It is also the prototype for all our subsequent experiences of love. That we have no memory of this experience matters not the slightest, because it is ingrained in each of us. The connection between love and sex is also explained by this thesis, because suckling at the breast is not only a source of nourishment, but a highly charged sexual experience as well. In fact, our very first. I know some of you will find this statement ludicrous. Bear with me. Though our love for the mother and the sexual experience that we enjoyed with her begins immediately after birth and persists throughout infancy, the two become split off during latency, which begins around the age of six and the sexual portion becomes repressed, though its affectionate aspect survives and remains conscious. In adolescence, our sexual desires break loose from their original moorings and are directed at new, non-incestuous love objects. However, in order for this to happen, the new love must in some respects resemble the old though we typically don't notice the similarities. Moreover, a second condition must be satisfied in order for this new love to occur. 
Our feelings for the new person mustn't arouse the guilt that we associate with the original love object. Otherwise, our unconscious guilt prompts us to repress any such feelings for this person, and we won't be able to love. According to Freud, quote, what is left over from the sexual relation to the first object helps prepare for the choice of a new object and thus restore happiness that was lost. This means that the experience of love and happiness are intertwined. But how can an infant be expected to fall in love? When the child experiences the mother, not as a separate person, but as a part of itself. Besides, both boys and girls enjoy the primary relation with the mother, or mothering figure. What about their gender differences? Is the experience the same for girls as it is for boys? In fact, this early suckling experience only introduces the child to an extraordinary sense of connectedness to another person. It doesn't, properly speaking, introduce us to love. Freud was convinced, however, that it does introduce us to sex. It's only later, when we enter the edible period from roughly three to five years, that we consciously fall in love with one or both parents. <coughs> Unlike the suckling experience, which is pre-verbal, we are acutely conscious of falling in love with this or that parental figure. But again, we repress this later. Freud believed we're born bisexual, so that during the Oedipal phase, we alternate between both parents, loving each in turn while experiencing the other as a rival, eventually settling on one. At this point, our sexual orientation, whether gay or straight, is fixed, though we may not know it at the time. This is usually the mother for the boy and the father for the girl, but it might just as well be the opposite, and often is. Whichever the case may be, this is the prototype for the relationship that we seek to refine in another person once we reach sexual maturity at puberty. Whereas the earlier suckling experience serves as a prototype for sexual pleasure and the feeling of connectedness that this occasions, it's only later during the Oedipal phase that our experience of love becomes truly personal. This is when we genuinely fall in love for the first time. And the parent or other close relation with whom we fall in love becomes a prototype for anyone we subsequently fall in love with. The two experiences, suckling and falling in love, are commingled into a unitary experience of sexual bliss. This explains why oral sex, whether kissing, fellatio, cunnilingus, are ways we typically recapitulate the bliss from the oral stage of development. That some people don't enjoy kissing says something about the early nurturing experience. Naturally, there's much in this model that can go wrong. Otherwise, there would be no neuroses, and by extension, no psychopathology. So what does this constellation of events tell us about <coughs> neurotic love, and how do we distinguish it from normal, happy love? Basically, mature love is the restoration of a happiness that was lost in early childhood. This may explain why people who fall in love often have the feeling that they've known this person forever, though they only just met. If our attachment to the parental love object was too strong, it inhibits the choice of a new love object. It's as though no one else can take their place. On the other hand, if the attachment was more subdued, resulting in greater psychic freedom, the adolescent will be able to find and fall in love with a new love object. Happy love is free from the ambivalence or inhibition 
that we associate with neurotic conflict, a conflict between desire and guilt. On the other hand, neurotic love is epitomized by the inhibition that prevents us from loving another person wholeheartedly. The other great discovery of Freud's was his theory of narcissism. This concept is crucial for understanding why people fall in love and why some people are incapable of it or of sustaining it. Freud observed that all babies are blessed with an omnipotent state of self-sufficient narcissism. This blissful condition, short-lived as it is, will eventually be shattered. The theory of narcissism implies that we begin life with two love objects, not one, the mother as well as ourself. In order to free ourselves to love others, we have to free ourselves from both the incestuous as well as the narcissistic. Because Freud believed that we're born bisexual, he also believed that homosexuality is a variant of normal development. In his famous essay on narcissism, Freud noted that identification plays a crucial role in falling in love. He believed that the future gay male baby forms an intense fixation to the mother or some other woman, and that after leaving her behind, identifies with that woman and takes himself as a sexual object. From this basis, he then looks for a young man who resembles himself and who then loves his mother loved him. The gay man who falls in love, in effect, becomes his mother and his lover becomes his former self. This kind of secondary narcissism, for a distinguished from primary narcissism, which is when we fall in love with ourselves. Now let's explore these two types of love further, the narcissistic and the incestuous. With the narcissistic type, a man may love himself, what he once was, or what he would like to be. With the incestuous type, a man may love the woman who feeds him, or the man who protects him. Gay men usually choose their love object based on the narcissistic model, whereas straight men typically choose their love object based on the incestuous. However, it's also possible for a straight men to adopt the narcissistic model, and gay men to adopt the incestuous type, though this is more likely among those who remain bisexual. The same process is repeated with gay women, but in reverse. Freud's discovery of narcissistic love ranks among his greatest discoveries. One of its most important features concerns the nature of the ego ideal, a crucial feature in falling in love. In the first stage of narcissistic development, we fall in love with ourselves. In the second stage, this love is transferred onto our ego ideal, the person we aspire to be. Traditionally, we contrast self-love, the receiving of love, with actively loving another person. But Freud introduces a third option, narcissistic love. When this al with this alternative, I fall in love with the person modeled on my love for myself. There's an inevitable tension between the love I seek from others, which is narcissistic, and the love I give them, which is sacrificial. Freud believed if I love the other person too much, I deplete my narcissism, which makes me feel unworthy of love. Those with poor self-esteem will be devastated if the love relation were to end, whereas the more self-confident person will survive to love another day once their narcissism is restored. This means that falling in love can impoverish the self to such an extent that we feel decimated. In some cases, the lover's self-esteem is restored by having his or her love reciprocated. But in other cases, the love object consumes oneself to the self's detriment. 
Moreover, there's an inevitable tension between the self and the ego ideal. We're always trying to bridge the gap between them because the closer together they become, which is to say the more I'm able to approximate the person I aspire to be, the happier I am. The further apart, the more miserable. If they're too far apart, it may result in psychosis when we appear to be two different people. The tension between them can be beneficial or detrimental. The beneficial, the ego ideal prompts the self toward greater achievement and is a source of ambition. If except for idealization of the parent was the most intense. When the ego ideal is projected onto this person, the tension between the self and the ego ideal is eliminated. The same process, by the way, that ensues in a manic state. When love is reciprocated, there is no finer experience. This is what it feels like to be head over heels and madly in love with another person. We're at the mercy of that person, and our judgment is singularly compromised. It's as though the self is now loved by the ego ideal, though this part of the experience is unconscious. Only the blissful feeling achieves consciousness. And this is about as happy as any human being can get. And for most, the prototype of how we conceive happiness. Now we can begin to understand why it isn't so easy to distinguish between what it feels like to fall in love when we succumb and when we succumb to a manic episode. In both cases, the ego and ego ideal merge, an experience of intense pleasure. Judgment is abandoned, and the sudden transformation may serve as either the beginning of a new relationship or initiation into a psychotic episode. <laughs> or both. <laughs> Phenomenologically, it is impossible to tell which is which. Anyone who falls in love and gives themselves completely to another person has lost his or her senses. There is nothing rational about this experience, which is also the most remarkable thing about falling in love. The respite that it gives us from the obsessive worry and relentless strategizing that the anxieties of our day-to-day -day existence impose on us. Now that we have an idea of the complexity involved in falling in love, we can begin to appreciate that it isn't so easy to know whom we are falling in love with, nor even who I am, for that matter. After all, don't we go into therapy in order to discover who we are? If we don't even know ourselves, how in the world could we presume to know others? If love compromises our judgment, it compromises our sanity as well. For sanity relies on sound judgment more than anything else. Love, then, is a kind of madness. But what kind of madness? Is it a good madness or bad? Or both? In order to answer this question, we need to look more closely at what we mean by love and the different types of experience that we designate as love. So far, we've only been talking about one kind of love exclusively, erotic or sexual love. What about those ways of loving that are not specifically erotic? In the English language, we have only one word for love, but the Greek says, I'm going to touch on only three. Erotic love, friendly love, which the Greeks called philia, and the most giving form of love possible, sympathic love, what the Greeks termed agape, but is more familiar in its Latinized form, caritas, literally meaning charity. I want to focus primarily on the difference between eros and caritas.
the two kinds of love that ensure genuine and lasting happiness. The Greeks saw eros as the most common form of love and the one most readily available. As we just saw, it is essentially narcissistic. Even when we love others erotically, we are in fact loving a projected image of ourselves, which is mixed up with early memories of our fathers and mothers and other people in our orbit. Perhaps this is why it is the one form of love that the Greeks associated with madness. However, erotically induced madness can either be a good, divinely sanctioned madness, or the bad demonic variety. Our greatest blessings, says Socrates in the Phaedrus, come to us by way of madness, provided the madness is given us by divine gift. Even before... Oh. Will we have a chance to get on love at first sight? Hmm? Will we have a chance to get on love at first sight? I mean, it's falling in love, which is the mechanism. Yeah, it's habit. Uh, are we okay? Yeah. Thanks, James. Maybe this is why erotic love is the one form of love that the Greeks associate with madness. However, oh yeah, I just did that. Uh, the, the design provides blessings. Even before Socrates, Greek literature was replete with references to Eros's dark side a demon spirit who is capable of savagery, injustice, drunkenness, even madness. After all, one of Eros's principal features is his ability to possess and bewitch those mortals he would destroy, those who got on the wrong side of Aphrodite. As we know, that peculiar form of madness that serial killers fall prey to is sexual in nature. <laughs> they kill what they love, and they love to kill. Yet Eros is also capable of giving us joy and wonder. Whether it is the good, healthy kind of madness or its opposite, erotic love is limited. This is due to its nature. Eros is hungry and insatiable, which is why it seeks proximity and wants to be with a love partner in all ways at all times. It is possessive. It is a love rooted in desire, so Eros wants the other, wants to both receive love and give love and rejoice in the energy it unleashes. Unlike Caritas, Eros cannot know the other, because mystery is its principal vehicle and the reason it causes us to lose judgment. If I were only capable of erotic love, my life would be profoundly constricted, and I would never find genuine happiness, no matter how many times I fall in love with however many people. Philia, or friendly love, is not erotically charged. It's epitomized by the friendships we enjoy, for whom we feel no sexual charge or urgency. In fact, friends, for the most part, offer us respite from the turmoil and uncertainty that occasions sexual relationships. This is why sex and therapy don't mix. <coughs> if we haven't already, we learn from our therapists other ways of loving a person that are not so possessive and narcissistic, but more giving. This is also what epitomizes friendships. Successful friendships thrive on reciprocity and don't do so well when one of the friends wants to hog all the attention. 
yes, we all have our share of narcissistic friends. For narcissists are usually attractive. And maybe to others, we are the narcissistic ones. But the friends we love the most are those who give as much as they take. This is why friendship, or philia, is an important step toward the most giving kind of love there is, caritas, or what I prefer to call sympathic love, rooted in a capacity for sympathy and compassion. When psychotherapy is successful, it teaches us something about friendship, because our therapist becomes our best friend, the one person we can confide in without fear of being judged or criticized. This is a person we can trust will not use everything we tell them against us. In fact, this is what we value most in friendships, the sense of trust <laughs> and fidelity they engender. The modern marriage is essentially an integration of erotic love and friendship. Marriages were originally rooted in legally binding, religiously sanctioned contracts that were obligatory. They were not rooted in romantic love the way they are today. Now we expect the relationship to serve both persons equally and reciprocally, not merely contractually. If such expectations are not met, the contract is usually broken. Erotic love is rooted in passion, not reciprocity. Once the passion subsides, if the reciprocity isn't there, one of the two parties will usually find the arrangement unacceptable. Caritas is even more selfless and more giving and less judgmental in our regard for whom we love. Not everyone is capable of accessing it consistently. It is the only form of loving that helps us know the other person as they are, not what we project onto them. Whereas friendships still contain an element of eros, a bridge, as it were, between eros and caritas, caritas is both benevolent and selfless. In relations that engender caritas, I seek more than proximity and affection. I hope to know who this person is in all her depth and complexity. The more I know, the more I like. That's how love works, full acceptance. According to Thomas Aquinas, the 13th century theologian, caritas consists in knowing the other person as that person is in his or her isness. This entails a letting be and leaving be, the opposite of desiring or transgressing. Without a capacity for caritas, we would be incapable of sympathy, the ability to know and give way to the other's innermost being. To be with someone sympathically means literally to be with that person's experience, feeling states, and suffering, without judgment. Without caritas, it would be difficult to be a psychotherapist. <coughs> This is why we associate caritas with the most giving elements of loving, including a capacity for generosity, devotion, commiseration, forgiveness, trust, and mercy. None of these qualities is erotically charged per se. Yet when we fall in love, we fall in love erotically. As we've seen, this is based almost entirely on what we project onto the other person. This occurs by a happenstance. We have no way of consciously knowing what we will project, and we can't control it. It could be a smile, a conversational inflection, a look in the eyes, or other idiosyncratic facial or behavioral feature that we happen to associate with someone we adored as a child, be it our mother, father, sister, brother, nursemaid, babysitter, family friend, you name it. 
What they all share in common is that we loved them in our infancy and a few years beyond. If there's an equation here, it's that the earlier the love, the more powerfully it sits in our unconscious. Yet over time, these projections are not enough to sustain a relationship. As the person we begin to know in their isness surreptitiously replaces the person we fell in love with. If we enjoy a capacity for caritas when we begin this relationship, we're also capable of falling in love with who that person genuinely is and begin to love that person even more deeply than the one we initially fell in love with. In this case, the surviving erotic and sympathically charged ways of loving commingle and persist after the heady intensity of the erotic addition subsides, as it inevitably will. But what happens if you harbor an impoverished relationship with Caritas because you're still too neurotic, ambivalent, or narcissistic to give yourself completely to another person? you just may be incapable of falling in love because you're still angry with that parental figure that you continue to hold on to. A figure that no one can replace because you're still in love with him or her and furious with them. You project all that onto the person you ostensibly fall in love with. But the resentment you harbor leaks in and drains your projections of all the goodness they momentarily enjoyed. As those projections fall away, you begin to feel the same disappointments you harbor toward that original love object. You begin to make demands that your lover change this or that about themselves. But it isn't your partner that you're trying to change, but the ghost of your past relationships. Naturally, those demands will prove futile. We are who we are, and we can't change that. This is why you can fall in love with a person you don't even like. <laughs> in fact, you may even despise this person and want nothing more than to punish and taunt them for all the pain you insist they cause you. Yet even this isn't likely to deter you if you are in love with this person. My love for the other doesn't depend on its being reciprocated. If it were, there would be no tragedy. <laughs> Without caritas, love cannot endure, no matter how strong the erotic component. So why is it that some people cannot fall in love? Or when they do, sustain it? This, after all, is the most chronic problem that brings people into therapy. We're talking about people who are only partially capable of loving others sympathically. What holds them back? It seems to me that the culprit is their narcissism. These unlucky souls love themselves ambivalently. This means they can only love others ambivalently as well. They're able to give, but they're more preoccupied with taking. Freud believed that loving in the non-narcissistic fashion is experienced by some people as a depleting of their essence, and they hold on to it for dear life. They tell themselves that when they get enough love from others, then they will reciprocate. But they never get enough to fill that void because there is nothing to fill. We are openness in our essence. We are raw and unadulterated engagement. There is no inside. It takes us a while to learn this. Meanwhile, we assume that the thing missing in our lives is that we haven't been loved enough. We simply need more. We may devote ourselves to being lovable, attractive, charismatic, 
in order to procure all the love we can get from our friends, family members, lovers. We have little to give because we're trying to compensate for all the things we didn't get in our troubled histories. Only when we have enough, we tell ourselves, will we be able to reciprocate. Narcissism is a much abused term and no doubt confusing because it contains both healthy and unhealthy elements. But it's worth wrestling with these complexities because we're all narcissistic in both senses of the term. Adolescence was a profoundly narcissistic time for us. And for the most part, we're still stuck in it. What does it take to become less narcissistic and more loving, less needy and more giving? The most intractable feature of narcissism is one's touchiness the proverbial narcissistic injury. All of us suffer narcissistic injuries as a matter of course. It happens every day in every way. It is unavoidable. But the person we label narcissistic is especially thin-skinned. It doesn't take much to rub them the wrong way. And if they feel slighted, it feels like an injustice that must be corrected. Our current president is a perfect example <laughs> of this character type. <laughs> but admittedly, his is an extreme example. <laughs> Most of us are of two minds about our narcissism. We're capable of love, but not consistently. We can be giving, but we can also be punitive and paranoid and read all kinds of motives into the reasons we feel other people let us down. Paranoia and narcissism are bedfellows. And we know that paranoia is the most resistant feature of our psychopathology to insight and reflection. Jealousy is also a problem. In fact, Freud situated the jealousy that we experience at the Oedipal stage as the source of our psychopathology, especially our narcissism. Can the narcissist find happiness? In a word, no. This is because happiness never comes from what we can get, from the abundance and security we are so convinced is attainable. It isn't. Happiness only comes from what we give, from our capacity to love, in the form of caritas, not from being loved, however rewarding that experience may be. Caritas is an inherently selfless way of loving that Buddhists and Christians alike have always known is the only true path to the equanimity we all seek. This has nothing to do with ethics or morality. You can compel yourself to behave ethically, to follow the rules, but this isn't love. You may be generous out of guilt for all the crimes you've committed in the service of your success, but this will never serve your conscience or make you happy. The happiness we seek derives from loving. Loving the life that we're living, the pastimes we enjoy, the friendships we commit to, the work we find rewarding, and most of all, the people we adore. There is nothing in life more rewarding than the relationships we call friends, lovers, children, colleagues, the very people in our lives with whom we sh choose to share intimacy. So in concluding, where does this leave us? If enduring love is predicated on our capacity for caritas, then it isn't a question of simply finding the right person to be with. Erotic love requires the happenstance of finding someone who triggers that recognition of this or that trait that we unconsciously associate with an early love object. Obviously, luck plays a role in this. It's a matter of chance, for example, that the two of us meet and that our projections will prove compatible. 
But once this happens, nothing will come of that union without a well-developed capacity for selflessness, the polar opposite of erotic, narcissistic self-interest. How can we develop this capacity if we haven't already? The answer, through inner work, psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, whatever mode of therapeutic commitment you trust. This can take a long time. Time. Some of us may pursue spiritual practices, others will pursue alternative forms of therapeutic engagement. If we're lucky and determined, any one of us can achieve this goal. All it takes is overcoming the self-absorption we've been committed to all our lives. This takes courage, which you probably know literally means open-heartedness. How do you open your heart when it's been closed for so long? This is something each of us must determine for ourselves. Thank you. Martini break for uh, questions. <laughs> Hello. Here's Frank. So uh, I'm going to try to help with uh, fielding questions for Michael. So are there questions that you'd like to pose to Michael? Yeah. Yes. Yes. You said we are empty. We are empty. We are raw and unadulterated. Could you elaborate? Well, I'm. Yeah, I was talking in um, in the context of uh, people that feel they can't get enough. You know, always trying to get more. That 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 feeling of filling oneself. So in, in, in that context, there there is nothing to fill. We're 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 out in the we're out in the world. That that's where we live. We don't live inside ourselves. Thank you. Next question. Yeah. Frank, can I ask you Um, my question is about um, what your um, thoughts are on uh, polyamorous love, where you love more than one person erotically. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's amazing the different ways we come up uh, with loving people, uh, also uh, in communal settings, not just polyamorously. Uh, we, we do seem to need a lot of love and a lot of relationships uh, in our lives. I don't think for most people one, one person doesn't do that. Um, but yeah, I think some people are very happy in, in multiple erotic relationships, and, and that really works for them. And uh, they, the only point that I would make about that is um, there also has to be some capacity for caritas and sympathetic, you know, ways of loving if, if they're going to be able to sustain that, you know, especially. I would, don't, wouldn't you think? I mean, because otherwise jealousy, greed, narcissism, all those things kind of come into it. So it's a balance, always. But how we balance that is completely up to us. You know, I, I think uh, we can be pretty creative when it comes to making relationships work. Um, Hi. Um, this question comes from a personal place. I'm trying to kind of um, apply your theory. And um, the question is, once you've left that period of eras, how do, um, I guess there's a question of choice around do I continue the relationship or do I make a commitment? In my case, the relationship is five, six months in, uh, my partner moved. And so it feels like there's a question in my mind of, okay, I felt the eros, it's subsided. And how do I know, how do I think about discerning whether there's a, a rightness, there's a caritas, but also other maybe more practical forms of compatibility? You mean should you... 
get involved with someone else? Or do I move to London? Forward. <laughs> <laughs> and it feels, it feels early because there's that loss of that at Eros, and then there's this, there's an inquiry around, at least for me, what is the what is really the love when that, that passion is gone, and how to make that choice. Um, yeah, I charge twenty-five dollars for uh, advice. <laughs> well, not looking for an answer, but ways to think about it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, um, I, well, that's a tough one, isn't it? I mean, I think if you, uh, I, I think that you know, for enduring relationships, you, you have both. You, you have the erotic as well as the non-erotic. Um, I, I mean, there are some uh, intimate relationships that have virtually no erotic component, you know, and, th and those seem to work perfectly well for some people. Um, and, uh, and of course, age is a factor, how long the relationship has continued. Uh, uh, usually the longer, you know, the relation, the more the erotic component gets so familiar, you know, uh, that it loses that uh, thrill. but. Um, I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, is, is the balance idea, you know, that it shouldn't be all one or the other, ideally, you know, we're, we're made up of all of these ways of loving a person, and that's what's so great about sexual relationships, is, is the potential for that degree of intimacy. Uh, but, you know, I know people that are, um, uh, very practical and pragmatic, you know, about their choice of relationships, and maybe moving to uh, London is impractical, you know. Uh, other people I know are very romantic, and they'll go to anywhere, you know, to be with the person that they love. You know. So uh, it's your call. <laughs> <laughs> what about love at first sight? Here's a you know, question right here, Michael. Every day. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, sure. She's first, and then... Uh... I just want to step back so there's not feedback. Hi, I, Hi. I'm Michelle Marzullo. I'm the chair of the Human Sexuality um, uh. PhD program here, and so... Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I have lots of thoughts on, on your talk, but thank you so much for giving it. Um, I, I think that um, there are two resources that come to mind that I wonder if, if you've encountered and I think might be interesting for you. Um, in regards to this talk, so I'm going to mention those two and then I'm going to kind of move on to my question. So the two are um, Lisa Diamond's book called Sexual Fluidity. Are you familiar with that work? No. no, no. Um, and then um, Michel Foucault's essay, Friendship as a Way of Life. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, so I think that my, my question is around this premise of um, suckling and a question around um, what happens to children, to infants who don't suckle. But then it, that concept is connected for, to me, um, in my mind, around uh, the difference between sex and gender, uh, where you know, sex generally, we have this idea of bifur a bifurcated idea of sex, which is very cultural because there can be more than one, I mean, two sexes, male and female. Likewise, there can be more than two genders, right? Man and woman, including transgender, but then, you know, multiple others. So, so what I'm getting at is Lisa Diamond's premise in her book, Sexual Fluidity, essentially updates Freud's idea of polymorphous perverse. To say that, <laughs> <coughs> the idea of bisexuality is too simple if we understand sex as more than two and then also gender as more than two. So I wonder how that idea just updates kind of what you're saying. You know, I, I think, you know, of course, within Freudianism, we just continually go back to it, and I think it's very cultural in terms of Western culture and understanding ourselves in the West. Um, but updating in terms of context, I think is important, and I just wonder if you have thoughts about that. That's all. Thank you. Mm, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, yeah, I think I think what you're saying, obviously, we live in far more um, interesting times uh, than Freud did a uh, hundred years ago. Uh, 
uh, you put Freud in context, and he was pretty radical in coming up with these ideas when people thought the first time you ever had any sexual feeling was at pu puberty. Um, but I, I think we're building on that, and, and that, of course, uh, our sexuality and our gender identity are all over the place, and, and they're very fluid. That's, I, that's exactly what I think I was trying to say to, tonight, is, is how fluid it really is. Is that it? No, it's fixed. It, but I do think that there is that uh, accidental piece of it, that whoever happens to be around, you know, in the first few years of our lives, where that that kind of sticks with us, and and I think that does explain uh, polymorphous uh, sexual uh, relationships and uh, and uh, transgender issues and so forth. I, I think that's all. Yeah. It just shows how amazing we really are when it comes to sex. Yeah, because because your thesis there really updates for for suckling thesis, right? I mean, that's a real update. Well, the whole suckling thing, uh, I think we do tend to take a little literally, you know, that you've uh, been breastfed. Uh, uh, Melanie Klein and her followers debated this issue for ages. You know, I mean, does it make any difference if you've actually been breastfed or bottle fed? Uh, whether it was the father or the mother or, you know, or, or somebody else, you know, who, who was the primary love object uh, in those early moments of your life. Uh, and, of course, we have no recollection of that period of our life. Uh, we're discovering that in the people we fall in love with. Uh, but, um, but, yeah, I, I think, um, I think it's, uh, uh, I think that part of it makes sense to me. You know that we don't just invent new people uh, to love in any willful, conscious, deliberate way. That there's always this piece of mystery and puzzlement to it. But thank you. So I had a question about love at first sight. I mean, maybe you could give me some answers. Like we should always be on the watch for it because uh, you know what could happen. <laughs> or uh, maybe this just means that uh, we loved ourselves so much that that we're always seeing a, a, a mirror reflection somewhere and therefore falling in love with something because. Uh, or or what do you have to say about that? I mean, it's happened to us. At least it's happened to some of us. It's happened to me a number of times. And you don't, you know, you don't have a commitment here. You're not just overblown sexually attractive to where uh -huh. the first thing you want to do is go approach them. But yet uh, they're on your mind, and it's uh, you've just been brainwashed with love. Uh -huh. And uh, so you might even develop a relationship. You might, uh, you know, try to stay in touch with the person. You might know them for years because of this uh, thing that happened, that you had this flash of experience. So now, in all of the context of what it came from suckling or it came from that you might have loved your mother or, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't see that giving me much of an answer of how I might have an experience of a love at first sight. Uh, but, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, what, what's your name? Uh, Arthur. Arthur, okay, so Arthur is wanting to know about, uh, for those of you who can hear, love at first sight. Uh, what, what about that? Yeah, do we need to be afraid, or does it exist, or anybody else? <laughs> 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 uh, well, you know, as, as Chad Baker, uh, one of my favorite jazz uh, uh, musicians uh, once said, some of us fall in love too easily, you know. Um, uh, yeah, you can fall in love at first sight. Clearly, there's something that got triggered uh, about that person's appearance and maybe something more than the appearance that just uh, triggers yeah, this, th this another, recognition. You might have met another intelligent person of the opposite sex. That yeah. You found an attraction for. Well, you know, we we're, we're all pretty um, uh, idiosyncratic. I think about this business. I mean, I, I think um, uh, some people fall in love pretty slowly. Uh, you know, they they take their time and they get to know a person and warm up to it, and and others just kind of rush in. And and I suppose a lot of that has to do with the nature of our own libido and uh, sexuality. And, um, you know, how recklessly and impulsively we're prepared to jump into a relationship with a person 
uh, versus how measured and deliberate you know we we are. Um, but uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. Are, are are you suggesting there's something bad about no, no, about no. falling I, in love? I just think it's kind of a shock that you should find uh, somebody so attractive that you just would you have the feeling of love at first sight. But that's. But I think that's what I was trying to get at. That that it doesn't make any sense, does it? Un unless unless it's triggered some recognition that that it's always a refinding. That, that I can't, 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 can't connect with that. That's All right, okay. Here's a question. <laughs> Michael, here's a question right here. Hi. And then there's a lady back there that's been holding up her hand. Yeah. My name is Emilio. Um, I understand from your, the way you characterize your model of narcissistic love that it was kind of based on an imbalance where the arrow sort of dominated in comparison to the caritas. I'm just curious whether you think in your model there could be a way that one could be narcissistic but uh, their love actually be much more imbalanced in terms of excessive caritas without the arrows. Maybe that they, you know, they're, they're loving some ego ideal of themselves but they're feeling that uh, to, to, you know, place that on the other person that they're gonna give so much caritas more and more that, that it's like how does that fit in like what do you think of that? You mean falling in love in a in a less erotically charged uh, yeah yeah uh, like how uh, the narcissistic yeah, yeah, yeah. model could could allow for a, an imbalance where the caritas dominates as opposed to the arrows to that. Well, for, it, first, for let, let, let me just say this. I, I don't have a problem with narcissism. Uh, I, I know that, that um, uh, some of the stuff that we were getting into tonight, there, there is, there can be a problem. Um, but uh, I think uh, a lot of people have kind of come to the uh, conclusion that you kind of have to love yourself. Uh, in order to love other people, you know, if you if you really feel bad about yourself, don't like yourself, etc., that's really going to affect how deeply and profoundly you can love other people. So I, I don't think you can bypass that erotic, narcissistic piece of it, because that's our relation with ourselves. You, you, you can't take that out of the equation. Uh, but yeah, there, we're obviously hoping to get it. Mm -hmm. Because I've certainly been like that, that way with a person, but I don't necessarily think I can go reflect and think that I'm in love with them. Or, but then I guess the sub part of that is that maybe the expectation or the idea of what love is and looks like is maybe I wasn't. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad you brought up uh, the business of uh, infatuation. Um, and I, yeah, I puzzle about that myself. Uh, you know, if if you find yourself, um, you know, really attracted to somebody and get a little obsessed with them, uh, is that mean that you just fell in love with that person? Um, I, I think... Um, I think there has to be more to it than that. Um, you know, there, there. Um, I mean, I, I, there, there are people who, of course, become obsessed uh, with a person that they never even met. You know, let, let alone have a relationship with. You know, they, they, uh, they, they may see them. You know, in their neighborhood, or, or maybe they're a famous actor or somebody. You know, like. Who's that guy who got obsessed with Jodie Foster, um, Hinkley, and um, well, 
you know, that's not really what I'm calling falling in love, although clearly somebody like that, yeah, that she triggered something in him, and uh, that recognition, you know. But he's too crazy, you know, to actually love a person in, in the sense that we're talking about. Uh, but infatuation, I think, happens all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, the more the better, I think. I mean, why not? It's, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but it's not necessarily somebody you have a relationship with. You know, to, to me, to really fall in love with the person the way I've been describing, you enter into a relationship, a sexual relationship with that person. You know, you know it, it, it's, um, I know it's possible uh, from afar uh, to be in love with the person and, and have all those elements of that love. Uh, those are those are exceptional, uh, but but that happens too. I think. Yeah. Uh, gosh, how are we gonna? Frank, are you keeping track on who? Uh, I'm just, who's? Just stand up. Just stand okay. up and project. Um, uh, fascinating. I mean, really, really enjoyed your talk. It felt like. At first, I didn't know you, and so there's this mystery, kind of erotic. <laughs> and then now I feel like I, I have as you are. I've taken on that journey just as you speak. <laughs> Here, here's my question, though. Uh, so the the notion of the. Uh, Caritas? Caritas. Caritas. Yeah, so, so it sounds like Eros in your model is chronologically preceding, typically, the development of the Caritas. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, because I think, I, I wonder if it's possible that potentially Caritas mm -hmm. might be what sometimes happens first, that I see mm -hmm. a person as they are, and then feelings start to emerge that I didn't know were present. Mm -hmm. right? like that, that, that the, perhaps the erotic might follow mm -hmm. that instead. And I was just wondering if you could speak to that, because it sounded like, okay, the first thing is like the arrow just kind of hooks you in, and then you start to kind of... No, I, I think uh, that's a good point. I'm so glad you... Uh, what's your name? Uh, Albert. Albert, Albert, yes, Albert. I'm so glad you mentioned that, because I think it does work that way sometimes, in reverse. It's... Um, I mean, look at the people that you've known as friends. Maybe you're each married to somebody else or whatever. You know, you've had this friendly relation for some time, and then suddenly you're single, they're single, and you start hanging out, and you fall in love. And for the first time, you have this intense, erotic relationship. Uh, but it's, it's based on this friendship, caritas, you know, that's been there already. And I think that happens a lot. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed, though, in my practice uh, is that, um, and this is uh, especially true of guys, I, I think, uh, maybe more than women. Uh, I might be getting into deep water by the same time. Gender distinctions here, um, but uh, they like to sneak up on the relationship. You know, they they uh, form a friendship with the person they're interested in, and they just kind of wait around, you know, for something to drop in from the sky. You know, I think they're hoping the other person will make that first move. You know, and um, and so in that case, they're uh, hiding that kind of erotic thing uh, out of their neurosis and, um, and just gliding along in the friendship, you know, until maybe something changes. Um, so there's that too. You know, we, we can, um, I, I don't want to make it sound like, oh, this erotic stuff is so mundane and just so primitive, which of course it is all those 
things. But um, and then we have this wonderful caritas and all this higher stuff. You know, if you're not careful, you become a priest. You know, and uh, you've just completely given up sex and you've just gone through this thing with God. And uh, I, I, I'm not advocating that. I, I, I think uh, I, I think the sex thing is so good. You know. <laughs> I mean, why, why leave that behind, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, anyway. I hope that answers the question. Uh, gosh, I don't know, how, how are we going to... Uh, here, you, you've been oh, raising your hand. Maybe you need to help us, James. Oh, I think, for, I think you should rely on Frank here. <laughs> okay. Yes? Yeah? Okay. Sounds good. So... Most of the, the discussion was hinging on Freudian analysis, and my understanding of neuroscience um, in a more kind of modern sense, uh, there's a gigantic gender distinction between how men and women love, and that isn't um, necessarily a bad thing, it's just sort of who we are evolutionarily, uh, from a biochemical standpoint, what's happening in a female brain is going to be dramatically different from what's happening in a male brain, and I wonder to what degree that's sort of informing the way in which we're forming heterosexual bonds because there's really, we're not coming to it from the same place at all. Mm -hmm. No, no, I, I absolutely agree with, with that. It's um, biologically, uh, there's a big difference. Anatomically, mm -hmm. of course, was Freud's favorite distinction, you know, having a penis or a vagina. Uh, and of course, existentially, uh, it has a lot to do with our self-identity. Uh, and uh, and yet, look at it. You know, you can have a penis and feel like you're a woman. Uh, and and it's uh, so so this business about identity. You know, how we identify ourselves. That's a pretty key piece of the whole puzzle, and that's pretty fluid. So, but yes, it still comes out of our biology and our uh, and anatomical uh, stuff, but uh, our psychology is profoundly impactful on, on who we take ourselves to be and how we experience ourselves. I don't think we're leaving all that biological stuff behind by any means. I, I think it's still front and center. But thanks. I think thanks the question, the, yes, Steve. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you're, uh, you're psychotic when you fall in <laughs> Sure. All that goes with it, hallucinating delusions. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I, my question, sir, is on the effects of trauma, in, especially in developing bonds of love, bonds of uh, friendship. Uh, you talk about how uh, you learn how to love pretty much from something like you learn how to love from fixating on the text. Let's take into account uh, individuals who have suffered severe childhood trauma, more trauma in adolescence, more trauma later on that may, for lack of a better term, poison the well. Uh, what then? How do we repair the model? Can the model be repaired? Uh, is there anything to be done? And uh, what's your general take on it? Well, uh, yeah, I figured the question of trauma would come up. Um, I, um, uh, I, it seems to me we focus on these very extreme uh, traumatic experiences uh, that, of course, um, God, we don't know how many people uh, suffer, you know, that kind of abuse as young kids. Uh, both physical abuse, sexual abuse, uh, emotional. Um, but I think trauma is much bigger than that, too. I, I don't think any of us have escaped trauma. Uh, and um, uh, I think that the most traumatic experience is feeling unloved. 
and, uh, and of course, children that are severely abused uh, get that in spades. But I think that is the traumatic piece of it. Uh, it it's amazing what we can handle uh, from just physical uh, abuse. It, it's the it's the psychological abuse. It's it's the feeling that these people that are supposed to protect you and love you are behaving in such hateful, sadistic ways that is really traumatic. Uh, and I do believe we're we're more vulnerable as children in that regard than any time in our lives. Um, I think that's just how we're we're put together. You know that that we need uh, extraordinary amounts of love in our life in order to make it uh, work. And and for the most part, we just try to adapt to doing without it. You know, I, I think that's kind of the sad part of it. Um, I, I, wanted to, I want to thank you. This has been very valuable to me. Um, I want to thank you for the refreshments. <laughs> part of what's speaking here. <laughs> <laughs> you, you talked about love. I agree that uh, the English language uh, has nearly enough words to describe all the different kinds of love. Enchanted detachment. Enchantment <laughs> was that love, which is the life that we all share. You know, and I can love that part of me that is in you or anybody else. So I really identify with that narcissistic part. You know, I understood that. we identify that there's this love that we already share with each other, and yet there's a need for detachment from the expectation of outcome, you know, and so that's, that's kind of a, a, a separate thing, but, but there is this changing need that I have seen throughout my life where there are times where I need, I need, to, be, I need to be in love, I need to feel <coughs> So the, the question, uh, I take it, is why is it sometimes we need to be in this proximity with people and these loving connections, and sometimes we just need to pull back from all that and be on our own? Well, is why is sometimes the need for connection so much more intense than in other times? Well, I don't know. Uh, that, that's the mystery, isn't it? It's... Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, Plato, uh, um, I think, uh, kind of wrote the definitive uh, book on love. Uh, it was one of his dialogues, The Symposium, which some of you might be familiar with. But it's, um, it's this gathering uh, at uh, Socrates, Socrates, of course, is the main guy. And... Um, and he, he invited all the people there at this banquet to each describe their definition of love. And there's about six or seven of these definitions that, that goes around. Um, and, uh, of course, the whole evening is left unresolved. Uh, but one of them, um, I can't remember which participant uh, it was, uh, maybe one of you know, uh, where he had this uh, idea that when we were, uh, when humans were first created, we actually had uh, four arms and four legs and two heads, and it looked like there were two people joined, you know, in front of it. Um, and, uh, and then something happened, and they got separated. 
and we end up only having two arms and two legs and one head and one genital organ. And we spend our lives looking for that missing half. And, uh, and that's a very powerful uh, you know, metaphor for um, how empty life can feel without a partner, you know, uh, somebody to share it with. Um, and, um, you know, I don't think there's anything better than that. I think uh, we have time for one more question. Okay, one more. Well, isn't this the topic of everybody's psychotherapy? <laughs> I mean, I, I know for me, you know, uh, I've been at this for what, maybe 40 years. It seems like that's what everybody's coming to therapy with, some kind of heartbreak. And um, uh, they may not realize that. Uh, that might not be their presenting symptom, you know, but, uh, but once uh, they get going, that's, that's what's happening, even if they're with somebody. Um, but um, uh, I think we're just born out the gate, uh, you know, needing this uh, connection. You know, you know, I mean, like the infant, you know, doesn't even know it's a separate creature uh, from the mother at first. It, it, still experiences almost like being in the womb with the umbilical connection. It, it takes time for each of us to come to realize that we're a separate self. And that feeling itself, that moment when that happens for a lot of psychoanalysts is the most traumatic moment in your life. You know, separation. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I think we're exploring that. You know, why, why do we get into these relationships that are so awful? And uh, because, yeah, we're repeating something from some parental person that was abusive and awful. Uh, but I, I, think, um, I think we can work on that. You know, I, I think it's possible to um, fall in love with good people, you know, not, not just awful people. Uh, it's true, some people have that pattern. You know, they always fall in love with this awful jerk, you know. Um, and, uh, I mean, that'd be awful. I mean, I've been lucky to fall in love with both types of people, uh, awful people, but also very wonderful people. And, and ideally, we, we can pull that off, you know, whatever went on with our parents in our early childhoods. I think if you're looking for love in your life, then that's always a possibility because a lot of people are not. You know, a lot of people that you're like you're describing, they, they've just given up on it. They've checked out. They're not interested. You know, that's too dangerous. And I and I can uh, respect that. You know, that maybe that's just too loaded. Uh, but I think there's always hope. If that's what you're looking for. Well, thank you so much. I think we're what out of time. Uh, More refreshments, and also I do have a few copies of my uh, book. If anybody's interested, there's a whole chapter in there on love and madness, uh, the death of desire. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for coming. Oh, um, if I could just, you know, make my own speech real quick, actually. <laughs> no, it's not really a whole speech, but I want to thank everyone for coming in. It really thank uh, Mike and Frank for the awesome talk um, and uh, just wanted to let you guys know about some things you might want to know about which in particular is the uh, you know the after party <laughs> um, um, but uh, let's see the after party the after party will be at my house <laughs> and it's not very far from here and it's um 
actually walkable. It's uh, in Hayes Valley. Um, so if you want to follow us there, we'll walk there. Um, but first, actually, I'd really invite you all to uh, mingle a little bit. There's still alcohol that we don't want to carry, you know? So if you could please um, drink some of that to lighten our load. Um, <laughs> And um, also, you'll find here a table where you can um, sign in, give us your email. We'll keep you updated about certain events, such as the Esalen Symposium that's coming up. Um, we're also starting a lot of programs. We're starting the Gnosis Retreat Center project, which is really a home for people um, to be a bit mad um, and have a loving community around them. Uh, without any sort of forced medication or anything like that. So I figured, you know, you guys might be the type of people, you know, interested in love as you are, to be interested in a loving community for people um, who probably need it the most. Um, so sign in for our email page, uh, buy Michael Thompson's book, follow us to the after party, continue the conversation, mingle a while here, and uh, thank you all so, so much for coming. Uh, see you next time.